Welcome, everyone. This is our fourth workshop session with Prem and Radha Carlisi. Prem and Radha Carlisi. <laughs> Let me first say thank you all for being here for my birthday. <laughs> what a, a fantastic celebration of uh, the day of my birth. Actually, it's tomorrow. I get to celebrate it twice because we're uh, 15 hours ahead. Mm -hmm. So actually tomorrow is my birthday in America. So today the topic's gonna be about uh, Ayurveda and the Ashtanga practice and how they are linked together. I discovered kind of early on that the, that the two sciences of yoga and Ayurveda were connected they were, they were always connected within the Vedic tradition. But a lot of people in America at that particular time, they did not know about Ayurveda. When I was traveling around India, Ayurveda is everywhere. It's like, it's on every street corner. There's a, a pharmacy, there's an Ayurvedic doctor sign. But I didn't know anything about it at that particular time. When I came back from one of my trips in, uh, in India in 19... I think it was 83. I came back, I didn't know what I was going to be doing, and I had a feeling that I wanted to go to Mount Madonna, which is a center in Santa Cruz, California. I heard about this yogi that was living there, so I picked up a yoga journal and I looked there and I, I was thumbing through and I went, oh, Mount Madonna Center, Baba Hari Das. And he was doing a course, like a one-month course, and I thought, perfect, I'll go up there. I've been hearing about him in this center for a long time. Nancy Gilgoff is, um, that's one of her teachers. And I'm not sure who else within the Ashtanga community is involved with Baba Haridas. He's still alive, by the way. And he's a yogi that came out of the mountains of, of the Himalayas. And uh, somebody discovered him and brought him to America. And he, he established a, uh, the Mount Madonna School and Center for Creative Arts. And it's a beautiful, beautiful place. It's up in the, in the mountains of Santa Cruz. It overlooks the Monterey Bay, Big Sur, the red, redwood trees, spectacular place. And they have 300 acres. So it wasn't a bad place to hang out. So I landed, I, I went there, signed up for this course. And um, Baba Haridas was like the main, the main focal point in his teaching. And he, he was teaching Ashtanga Yoga, but not Ashtanga Yoga, not Ashtanga Vinyasa Yoga. He was teaching the eight limbs the yama, niyama, asana, pranayama, he was, he had, it was like the, the whole package, the whole, all eight limbs he was speaking about. Um, within that program, there was an Ayurvedic section. And the, the man who was teaching it was Dr. Vasant Ladd. So if you're interested in checking out more about Ayurveda, I would suggest that you, you check him out. So Dr. Vasant Ladd did a one-week Ayurvedic course within this one-month training that I did there. I fell in love with the man. He was so, so amazing, beautiful, beautiful being. And um, he, was, uh, he was an expert in the science of Ayurveda. Clinically, like he would see people clinically, a pulse expert. He could just sit and do someone's pulse and then say, oh, how's your liver? What's going on there? Or, you're, you know, what happened with your father? It was like, how could you tell that by the pulse, you know? And I used to sit in on consultations with him for several years. So in meeting him, I got really excited about Ayurveda. I was like, I, I have to study this. I have to be with this man. And um, he said that he lived in Albuquerque. And of course, being the poor yogi that I was and unemployable, um, I, said, I said to the man who brought him over to America, his name is Lenny Blank, and he helped him publish his books and everything. And, created many things around the Ayurvedic community. I, I told Lenny, I really want to come study with Dr. Ladd. Is, you know, what, what can I do? How can we work? He said, just videotape Dr. Ladd speaking in his two-year course that he's doing there, and I'll let you take it for free. And I said, well, I, I'm not a videographer. I don't know how to do that. He said, just man the camera. Just set it up and just like Make sure it's just focus on him and then just, you know, you can take notes and do whatever. I said, okay, great. So I got to take the course for free and I just videotaped him. 
it was an evening course so I could, I could work during the day and then take the course at night. So I did that for a couple of years. And I learned everything I could from him and I stayed on with him for another couple of years. And I did clinical work with him. I learned how to do Panchakarma. I administered Panchakarma. We had a Panchakarma center there. I learned about all the Ayurvedic herbs. I did pulse with him. And he would, you know, working one-on-one -on -one with him, he would say, what do you, he called me Tony G. Guruji used to call me man with many names, you know, like he would, he would just laugh when every time, every time I changed my name. <laughs> and he actually gave me an Indian name. When I first met Guruji in the first trip, he called me Raghava. And from, from the moment that I met him and he gave me that name, he always called me Raghava. And he used to yell at me in the room and he'd say, Raghava, what are you doing? You know, why? And I would go, and everyone would go, who's Raghava? And I'd go, I don't know. <laughs> I kept it kind of incognito, you know. So at that particular time, I was going as Tony. And then later I became Anthony. And now I'm Prim. <laughs> well, you know, maybe next year I'll change it again. I don't know. Um, so he called me Tony G, and G is kind of a reverent way of like, oh, okay, Tony G, what do you think of what's going on with this person? Take their pulse, tell me what's going on. I would take their pulse, and I'd say, well, their vata is high, and you know, the, the colon energy is a little bit blah, 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 and you go, well, what else do you feel there? And I'd, I'd go, I, I don't know, Dr. Ladd. And he would say, what about the liver pulse? And I would check and see, and I'd say, oh, okay, yeah, I can feel something, but it's like so subtle. You have to be so aware and so present. And there's so much information going through your fingers. It's an art. And like anything else, it takes years and years. And he was a master of it. So I got to sit in with that. And then, and then just how, watch him, how he observed people and how he listened attentively. And how he could just see what was going on. And I just, I learned so much from this man. Beautiful man. Um, we were always doing mantra. He was very, he loved Ganesh. Ganesh was his, you know, uh, deity of choice. And um, just sweet man. He had a couple of kids. He, um, at the time, uh, I'm going to make it kind of short. I want to give you the, the long version. But I ended up uh, getting married in Albuquerque through him. He, he did a, a, a ceremony. And Shanti was born there. Shanti was born in Albuquerque in 1986. So I was with Dr. Ladd from 83 to 87 or so. I left there with this knowledge and I thought, I, I really want to you know, share this with people along with the Ashtanga Yoga. I was teaching Ashtanga Yoga in Albuquerque. And at that time, you know, there was no money in it, obviously. Um, well, maybe not so obviously to you. But I had, to wash, I had a, a window washing business. <laughs> I was afraid of heights. It was a little bit... <laughs> It was a little bit ODD. You know ODD? Odd. Yeah, a little odd. <laughs> Not OCD, ODD. It's a little odd. I love saying, like, that dude's really ODD. And I go, what do you mean? Yeah, he's odd, you know? <laughs> so it was a little strange. You know, I had to make money wherever I could because yoga was not a money thing. It didn't happen that I, I started making money until maybe last year or something. <laughs> um, but it was always, I was always doing something else, and then I would teach. And whoever showed up was a bonus, and I, would, I did free stuff, I, donation, whatever. So I was doing, you know, these odd ODD jobs, and, um, and making money and doing that. So when I left, when we left Albuquerque, we went back to the area that I grew up in Arizona. Went back to Phoenix, Arizona. And then I, I really had this passion for continuing to teach Ashtanga, but I also wanted to integrate the whole thing with Ayurveda. So I was doing workshops about it and talking to people about Ashtanga Yoga and Ayurveda and the benefits of Ayurveda and how important it is and the beauty of it and how it's, it's such a, a beautiful science. And if you don't know about it already, I, I highly encourage that you check it out. It fits perfectly with yoga. If you have any question about diet or herbs or anything in regards to lifestyle, sleeping, your sexual behavior, climate, everything, gems, scent, you know, what kind of clothes, colors, everything. Everything is specific. It's, it's in regards to your own particular inherent energy. Everyone has a unique 
totally distinct kind of energy. So you need to know what that is. And within the, within the, the Vedic knowledge, within the Vedic download that's available to anyone when they really quiet themselves and allow that to happen. So what's really interesting is that each one of you, you already know it. It's in the cells of your body. Ayurveda is inherent in your cells. So the exterior knowledge, anything that anyone speaks of around Ayurveda or yoga, when it resonates, what does resonation mean? It's just like, hmm, it kind of hums, right? And you go, wow, yeah, that feels bright. Ashtanga yoga, mm hmm. Ayurveda, yeah, right? So that person, mm hmm. And then you'll, you know, you'll meet someone, you'll go, hmm, but you're really cute, you know? So that doesn't always offer, you know, if you're operating from a different level, then you get into trouble. And that might be your karma to go through. And if anyone read my book, you can tell I had a lot of wild roller coaster ride because I wasn't always on it and I was young and dumb and whatever but I had to go through certain things and I learned a lot and that's part of what I share when I when I teach so that you guys don't make the same mistake although you probably will <laughs> um, so this the Ayurveda was there with me and I, I I was doing workshops I was doing consultations with people but I slowly started to see the people that, that would come to me and they just wanted a consultation without doing yoga. They just wanted to be fixed. And I didn't want to fix people because I didn't think they were broken. So I started to back off on consultations. But I would do it with students because I had a relation, a relating with them. Not a relationship, not a relationship, <laughs> a relating. I had a relating that was going on with everybody. So I could see what was going on and then I would communicate to them maybe in a subtle way or maybe a direct way or they would do a consultation with me and I'd say, I'd, I'd kind of talk to them just like we do with people here. So I slowly backed off of the consultation realm of being, playing doctor. I didn't want to play doctor. I didn't want to <laughs> take their pulse and then they'd say, what herb do I take? You know, what, what should I eat? It's like, okay, that's great, but it's the bigger picture is, are you doing yoga? Are you meditating? Are, you know, what's your lifestyle like? It really comes down to that. The diet and the herbs and all that, they're great. But it's just one spoke. And they go to the center thing. They go to the center vortex. So you have to be really clear. In the Vedic tradition, they, they say, what is your svadharma? Krishna talks about it. And it's in the Vedic text. What is your svadharma? Your svadharma is your own particular way in which you uh, are resonating with the exterior world. Everybody has a different combination of energies. In Ayurveda they say there's five primary elements and then it's broken into the Vata Pitta Kapha. Okay? So the five primary elements, you can remember them on your fingers or your toes, is earth, water, that's why water is more emotional. You get married and you say, oh, I love you. Will you love me? You put it on your ring, this finger, water finger. This one, sorry, I'm not doing it to you. That's your, what, what, what element you think that is? It's a fire finger. This is air. And this is space. Five elements. Okay? So they're there. And they're related, they're associated with your five senses. So what do you think earth is related to? What sense organ? Earth. Earth element. How do you perceive earth? No? What's the dense, the most gross sense organ? Okay, I'll give it to you. <laughs> Smell. Smell. Smell is related to earth. Water element? Pardon me? Yeah, taste. Fire element? Eyes. You know the expression, fire in the eyes? When someone's radiantly healthy, you can see it in their eyes. Radiant health. Radiant. Radiant, vibrant health. Okay, air. Just take a moment and just, can you feel the fan? Skin. On your skin? Yeah, touch. And then the most subtle one, there's only one left, hearing. It's 
with space. Space. So we have earth, water, fire, air, and space. And our five senses, they perceive these on the grossest possible level in our physical wet world. But then there's the more subtle aspects of all those five elements. For instance, the earth element is related to your groundedness. If you're not feeling grounded, you have a lack of earth element. <coughs> if you're not flowing in your life and things are stagnant, it's not, we're, we're made up of primarily <coughs> water, right? Interesting stuff with the five elements too. There's, um, there's a scientific fact, and we all know it. Like I just said, that we're primarily made of water. What percentage have they said that, that we are? 75, 80% water? What's the planet made of? It's the same. If we're doing a, a percentage of 75, 80% or 90%, it's the same. Okay? We have a relationship with the planet. That's why it is so important. That's why David said hydrate. Make sure you're well hydrated. It's really important. Now your hydration, there's a lot that I can go into. Just keep that in mind. Okay? When you're in a place like Bali, you need to hydrate more. You also need to add something to the water so that it gets absorbed. If you're just drinking plain water like purified water, it'll just go right through you. That's good for purifying you, but it'll just, like, it'll, it'll just go right through you. You're not hydrating. So you add something to the water, and then it will it'll get absorbed. Okay? So these five elements, they're, they're on the gross physical level. They're, they're very important, but then on the subtle, the more subtle level, they go deeper. Okay? So... Um, there's this symbiotic relationship. Symbiotic means like that there's a, a dance between the outer and the inner. In, in Ayurveda and yoga, they say that there's the, the microcosm and the macrocosm. We're a mini universe. We're a mini universe. There's a sun, there's stars, there's the moon, there's all these different components of the universe inside of us. That's why all the saints and sages say, if you want to find out about yourself, you want to find out about the universe, go within your own universe. Don't look outside yourself to discover what's going on. Go inside. They encourage everyone to go inside and in introspection. Inner space explorer. <coughs> Not outer space explorer. Okay? So fire related to the fire here inside. Fire outside. Fire outside is the sun. Fire inside. What's this area called? The solar plexus. The agni. There's an agni that resides here. When your agni is burning strong, you're taking in food, or there's an agni in the brain. When this agni is good, when you have good digestion, this one will work. Also, vice versa. Okay? If you have emotional, mental stuff going on, you're not going to digest. So if there's a lot of stress, and you eat because you're stressed, it won't get digested, even if it's organic and vegan and all this other stuff that we're talking about. right? So there's that connection. Um, water, we talked about earth, fire. Again, the, the sun is the exterior fire, the macrocosm, the fire inside, the digestion. There's, it's called Agni. Agni is responsible for radiant, vibrant health. They say that Agni is like one of the most important things. Does the Ashtanga practice stoke your Agni? For sure, especially first series. There's all this. It's toning all, get, it gets the Agni going. Have you noticed like how your digestion maybe has changed by practicing? It works that. It, it helps to purify you. Purification, fire is purification. 
Okay? The air element on the exterior world, we just, we just noticed this recently with the Philippines. It's moving things. It's moving the weather patterns. It's responsible for movement. Air is responsible for movement. Inside your body, it's responsible for movement. Your heart beating, your breath, eye movement, thinking, all, all movement. Thought process, that's air. And then space is very interesting. Even within the, the context of the scientific world, they've looked with the, the most high-powered magnification microscope. They've taken a cell and they looked into the cell and they looked at it and they went, oh my God, this human cell is 99.99999% space. We're made of trillions of cells. You do the math. What are we made up of mostly? We're made up of mostly space. That's how subtle we are. We're barely here. Seriously. I mean, even the scientists are looking at it and going, oh my God, like the cell is like mostly space. Okay, the other four elements are just there kind of maintaining the physicality of who we are and operating within the context of gravitation. The yoga practice is about aligning yourself with gravity. We're looking for that vertical line. You're hunching, you're standing, it'll start, you see some, some people that have aged not, not so gracefully, and they're stuck like this. You want to come up to them and go, <laughs> but it won't work, it'll break them. So, that's why the pumping, the moving, the t it's all about the danda, the, the staff of the spine. Okay? The yoga practice helps to keep the spine healthy. You're only as healthy as your spine, right? You heard that before? Heard that before, David? Yeah. <laughs> so, you can tell. I met this one man in, in uh, India. Um, I never met Krishnamacharya, but I met this guy in, in a place called uh, Kaivaladhamma. Kaivaladhamma is a yoga institute where they did extensive research. Awesome place. They have a library that's about as big as this room, filled with yoga books. In Lonavla, it's near Pune, near Pune. I spent like a, a full, a, a couple of months there. That's where I learned the Shakriyas originally. I learned Neti from Guruji, and that's a funny story. I won't tell it here, but <laughs> that was pretty interesting, fun time with Guruji. It was hilarious, actually. Um, and then I learned Vastra Dauti. I learned yoga basti, sucking water up into the colon. That was a nice trick. I got in, I got in a bathtub and I could empty it. <laughs> Great that was pretty trick. cool. You know, I learned Nali. I learned Nali through, uh, you know, the whole crew that came and taught. Like Gary and Brad showed me Nali right away and I got that right away. I, I must have been a yogi before. I, I got that stuff right away. And I, I went through the practice pretty quick. I did advanced day and all that stuff. So, all this stuff was quite natural for me, and I wasn't much, I mean, when I was in my 20s, this is what I looked like, except without the gray hair. <laughs> I look at my body from here down, and I go, wow, nice, it's, gone. it's working. <laughs> but for, you know, like the gray hair and stuff, it kind of gives me away. Um, and it's funny, when I was, uh, when I was writing, writing my book, and I was with Rod at the time, I was so manic with it. I was just like, oh, I could do this book. And my, my beard and my hair was short. And I was just like, oh, uh, and I was on my computer day and night and for like a year. And my hair was going. <laughs> I was like, you okay with this? You know, she was like feeding me. We got to go to the beach. I was in Hawaii and Sri Lanka. And it was just, it was, it was pretty funny. You started to look like a caveman. <laughs> I still do. It still does. <laughs> I thought I'd keep it, because then once I grew the beard, then people miraculously started listening to me. <laughs> before well, before they didn't believe said. me, they were, oh, Tony, Anthony, whatever, Pram, you're such a jokester. And then I grew the beard, and they were like, hmm, wow, he looks like smart. <laughs> Little did they know. Like, she lives with me, and she's like, oh my God, these people are like so duped. Um, so... You know, we wear the guys sometimes. 
That's, this is actually Velcroed on. I tell little kids, they're like, wow, that's cool. It's like, it's Velcroed, don't tell anybody. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, the five elements are quite interesting. Internal, external. So, as you start to go deeper within yourself, and you start to learn about these five elements, they start showing up all around you. They start revealing themselves. I say that this, the, it's an inside job. Because I'm, I'm Sicilian, Antonio Carlisi. It's an inside job, okay? You go in and everything gets revealed. It's already there. It's not like you have to have more knowledge. It's already inherent in every cell. You just got to get out of the freaking way. And that's the process of yoga and meditation. <coughs> that letting go process of letting go of the, the goofy programs that we've gotten from generations you see, like there's a genetic code. Even if there's heart disease or any of this other stuff that's in your genetic code, you can change it. You can be the one that can change it. Your cells can change. It's possible. Possible. So these five elements were then combined within the context of Ayurveda and Tavata Pitta Kapha. Kapha is earth and water element combined together. And it's the principle of stability, stamina, strength, structure. Pitta is the element of fire and water. They're combined together. And it's the principle of transformation. And then vata, or vata, is the element of air and ether combined together. And it's the principle of movement. Now, every single one of you has a combination, a permutation of this Vata Pitta Kapha. Now each of us has a unique kind of, it's called Prakruti, your constitution, your inherent constitution, what you were born with, like your astrological, <coughs> you came in like I came in today or tomorrow actually. I came in at a particular time. Oh, you're a Scorpio, but actually I'm a Libra in Vedic astrology. Different stuff. Check out Vedic Astrology. Check out my brother, Jeffrey Armstrong. He was going to come, couldn't make it. Brilliant Vedic Astrologer. 50 years Vedic Astrologer. Um, it has a different way of viewing what's going on. It's more current. The Western Astrology, it's cool. It's kind of fun, interesting. But Vedic Astrology is more like, boom, like accurate and to the point. So being a Scorpio sun, I'm actually a... Uh, sun and Libra, everything kind of goes back 23 degrees. So all of the components and characteristics kind of change. There's relevance to the Western astrology, but the Vedic is where it's at. So each of us being unique within the context of this, this Vata Pitta Kapha, we need to know what our Prakriti is. So an Ayurvedic doctor will, can see it. They can do it with a pulse. They can do it with like a little questioning or they can just see it right away and they can just go, oh, Pitta Kapha or Vata Pitta or usually you're a combination of two. You're primarily one and then secondarily another. Very rarely have I seen a pure Vata person, a pure Pitta person, a pure Kapha person. You're usually a predominant one and then secondarily another one. Okay, so that's your Prakruti. That's your constitution. You're born with that. At the moment of conception, when mommy and daddy had some fun and the, and the sperm and the egg met, boom, you were created and your constitution is there. Now there's some changing that can take place within the womb. If the mother's a drug addict, there's you know, a lot of emotional stuff. It can create something different. But primarily it's, it's, it's created at the moment of conception. Now, your prakriti stays the same through your whole life. It does not change. Your vikriti, your vikriti, which means the vata pitta kapha that's going on outside of you, which is constantly changing. Every 24 hours it's changing. From 3 to 6 in the morning and 3 to 6 in the afternoon, which are the most predominant, they're, they're the highest vibe times for meditation and the change of going from, from uh, dark to light and light to dark. They're really powerful meditations times. That's why 
I, I like to get up at that time. That, that three to six time is the most powerful time. It's going from dark, darkness to light. Okay? So that's a vata time. That's a vata period. Vata is the highest at that particular time. Air and ether. The vibe is high. It's ethereal. You feel it in the air. That time is like more, it's vibrating more with that kind of ethereal nature. Notice, and you've, I'm sure all this stuff that I'm talking about, you've noticed within your life. If you sleep in too late, say like past sunset or a little bit deeper into the day, su sunrise, sorry, you feel a little heavy, feel a little bit more dense, a little bit more lethargic, a little bit more tamasic. That's because kapha has set in, which is earth and water. It's dense, it's thick, it's heavy. Doesn't mean that it's bad. You know, this whole thing with the, the sattvic, rajasic, Tam um, uh, tamasic, they're important. They're important energies. When you go to bed, you want to have some tamasic energy. You don't want to be rajasic or sattvic. It's like tamasic helps you to sleep. And then the energy changes, just like the energy, the internal, external, micro, macro. Okay? So the time, the like 6 to 10 in the morning, 6 to 10 in the evening, it's kapha. And then from 10 to 3, and 10 to 3 at night is pitta, fire. Fire is the highest. It's the strongest. Okay? And you'll notice that if you stay up too late, which is what musicians do and creative people do. They'll stay up late. It'll kick into pitta again, which is a very creative time. And there's a lot of light bulbs going off. Light, light bulbs. Right? Energy, fire. Fire's in the head. That's, it's responsible for perception and clarity. Pitta's like, okay? So a lot of creativity. So if you stay past that particular time, it kicks in and then it's harder to go to bed. So if you catch it in that window of kapha, you're more likely to go into a deeper state of rest. If you stay up too late, it'll kick into pitta again and then you're up. That's why all the raves and the parties, they don't get going until like 11 o'clock, right? And then they party through the pitta time. <laughs> right? It's all there. It's there. Okay? It's inherent in nature. People are doing it. They don't know why, but they're plugging into it. Okay? Everyone following me so far? Okay. Um, so we have this, this um, we have the external energy of the Vata Pitta Kapha, and we have our own internal environment of Vata Pitta Kapha. So how do we match those two up? That's the art. That's the art, and that's the science of knowing Ayurveda. If you know who you are from that place, your Svadharma, you know you're a vata pitta person. That's what I am. I'm predominantly vata, pretty close second pitta. If I know that about myself, I know that I have to really watch my vata. I have to keep a vigilant eye and a focus on vata. Now what that means for me is that the vata energy, there's, there's certain attributes that go along with vata. Vata is dispersing. Vata is fast. It's dry. It's light. It's ethereal. It loves to, tr you know, Vata people love to travel. They love to talk. They love to, right? And they get dried out. They get dried out on the outside and the inside. They have a tendency towards constipation. I'm giving it away, but it's okay now. I'm all right. <laughs> I learned how to work with it. So, but there was always a constant. And, and one of the primary things that happen with Vata people is, Anxiety, fear, insecurity, nervousness, biting nails. I used to bite my nails like crazy when I was a kid. Just nervous energy. A lot of cracking, crack, crack, crack. Always cracking, crack, crack. You know, <laughs> popping, popping. And they'll just naturally crack all the time. You know, they're like, they get up and they crack, crack. And crack, crack. So if the cracking, popping sound, that's dryness. And miraculously, if you, if you change your diet, add a little bit more 
oil to the diet. It's like the Tin Man and the Wizard of Oz. Chicky, 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 chicky. Do you see the Wizard of Oz? It's like, <laughs> put some oil in there. So internally, externally, oiling your body, vata starts to calm. It starts to calm. You feel more like, ah. Because oil is what? Oil is kapha. It's the opposite of vata. So kapha will pacify vata. Opposites balance. Okay, it's pretty simple stuff. It's already inherent in you. But a lot of times we just, we don't pay attention to it. We ignore it, in fact. In fact, we gravitate towards some of the worst things possible to us. Like I said, Vata people, they love to talk. They love to travel. They love to blah, 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 blah. Right? And then their Vata gets like that, and then they're like, ah! And then they, they crash and burn. Right? <laughs> and then they're like, oh, shit, I got to, you know. They go opposite. They, big pendulum swings. Wah, wah, wah. And then they, the, Extreme. the pendulum <laughs> swing, you know what a pendulum does? It goes like this. You think it stops here and then goes back like that? No. No, it goes like this, <laughs> and then it goes all the way over here. So, it's the binge and purge people, right? <laughs> and they're like, oh, no, no, I got to fast. I gotta, I'm going to go to the mountains, and I'm gonna, like, not going to do anything. That's vata, extreme, 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 extreme. And they're, they're regularly, they, they do consistent things regularly, irregularly. Irregular, irregular. They're consistently irregular. <laughs> so, sometimes they'll be hungry, sometimes not. Their appetite's good for a couple of days, and there's no appetite. They'll sleep good for a day, then two days they're not sleeping. Mm -hmm. It's like so erect. So how do you contain vata? How do you contain it? You got to hone it in. You got to learn how to ground yourself in your practice. A vata person's going to practice like a wild maniac. <laughs> what? Shit, what? Shit, tr what time is it? Off to the next event. <laughs> Not good for a Vata person. It will just be like, yeah, just, no, no time for Shavasana. I gotta go. <laughs> Shavasana is like really important. Like calm, grounded, <laughs> slow down. So that's how we approach people. We see a Vata person, they go, just slow down, honey. Just okay. Just slow. Ground, grounding, you know, ground your energy. Let the energy go down into the earth. Feel your feet. Mm. Can you stand on your own two feet? Samastitihi. You ever heard that expression? Like, can you stand on your own two feet? <laughs> your parents never said that? Learn to stand on your own two feet. That's samasiti, balanced standing. Now that's, okay, you can just stand still and try to figure out like the forward, backward, side to side, vertical gravitation working with the earth. We're on earth. It's part of the ritam. The Ritam is the natural order of things. Nothing is random. Does the sun not rise at a particular time every day? Does it not set a particular time? Do the scientists not know how fast the revolution of the earth is, how far the earth is from the sun, from the moon, from... It's all calculable. They knew this thousands of years ago from their intuition from being inner space explorers. Inner space explorers. That's what meditation is all about. That's what yoga is all about. Inner space explorers. How fun is that? Huh? Everyone's like, oh, I can't wait. Like the Virgin Airlines guy bought like some property in New Kooning and he's, he's got like the rocket ship thing that goes close to it and you can go around the, the planet, right? People are buying us, it costs like $100,000 <laughs> per ticket. It's like... I'm more excited about inner space exploration because it's all there. There's inner worlds that are there waiting for you to discover. That's meditation. There's so many worlds. There's physical, there's the physical world that we operate from. But there's so many subtle things. When you close your eyes and go inside, astrally going somewhere, all this stuff, all these visions, all these vision quests. I did all kinds of stuff. Ayahuasca, mushrooms, psychedelics. All that stuff's available to you through meditation, not mad attention, right? Most people, they sit and it's mad attention. They're, they're, they can't sit still. It's just mad attention. They're restless in their body. They can't sit still. That's what the yoga is all about. 
the stilling of the body, stilling of the mind. The Ashtanga Yoga is a beautiful practice to help you to get to this place. This is the true asana. And Patanjali says asana. He's not talking about the asana and leg behind the head and all that. Here it is right here. Your asana of choice where you can sit for three hours without moving. Start with five minutes. <laughs> slowly build up. And eventually, all time space disappears because it doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. It really doesn't. That's why all the masters and teachers always talk about, this is it. This is it. The present moment. This is all we got. The past and the future does not exist. We're on just this trip. And we've been here, like Danny said, thousands of times. We've had millions of different births. We're just traveling through. I got this big time. And Shanti died. Wow. What a reality check. Wow. I'm not going to last forever. This physicalness is not here. We're only here temporarily. We're in the amusement park. It's beautiful. It's amazing. Look at this place. Look at this place all around us. Check out nature. Be in nature. Watch a butterfly, a dragonfly. All the beauty. So amazing. We're so blessed. We are so blessed. Take advantage. Live every moment of your life like it's your last moment. Every breath is so precious. Don't waste your life. That's why you've been given this human birth. It's a gift. It's an absolute gift. Even the devas, the angels, they're like jealous of us. They're not in bodies, but they're less like, and they're here to help us. There's devas all around. Ganesh, all these, there's all devas. They're like presence. They're like angels, energy. And you can connect in with them. There's a 911 hotline to Ganesh if you want it. Seriously, you can call up Ganesh. That's what mantra is all about. Gam Ganapati Namo Nama. Gam Ganapati Namo Nama. Ganesha Sharanam Sharanam Ganesha. It's like 911 Ganesha. It's like Ganesh, help me through some obstacles. It's there. It's available. You got it. It's there. Available to you. Anytime. But we're like, oh, where do I go? How do we do it? We're like mad people. We're all mad. We're all mad on one level. Right? I don't want to forget this um, little ingredient. The Baba that I went to go see, Baba Haridas, in Santa Cruz, he was silent. He didn't speak. And he had been silent for, when I met him, probably, I don't know, 30 years or something. He's actually, I don't know if you're aware of this, but he's, he's on his way out. I, I mentioned it. He's not doing real well. I think he's about 94, 95 right now. Seems to be the age. I don't know what's going on. But um, he's, he's uh, having a difficult time in his physical body and Quite an amazing yogi. He, he did not speak and he, hasn't, he didn't speak for now like another, if that was 25, add on another 35 to that. So yeah, he had, a, he had a chalkboard. It was really sweet. He had like a little chalkboard and, and um, you know, you would ask him a question and he'd go and then he would go like that to the person sitting next to him and go. And it was just like these one liner things, you know, he couldn't like He's sitting there all day. You just go, like Guruji, you know, practice all is coming or you, you, whatever, you know, like these little one-liner kind of things where you're like, whoa, that's profound, you know. Like, to be able to speak like that, he said why he went, uh, it's called Mon Mona? Mount Mauna. Mauna. Mauna, yeah. Mauna. To, to like, it's a, it's a yogic um, practice of giving up, 
speech because we waste so much energy, so much prana by talking, especially needlessly. Blah, 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 right? A lot of energy is wasted. A lot of essential prana is wasted. Okay? And again, it increases your vata if you're always talking. So, Scott came up to me and, and um, he, he studied with someone that, that was part of the Ayurvedic Institute. His name is Robert Swoboda. Anybody heard of him? Yeah. Dr. Ravi Swoboda. Yeah. Brilliant guy. He, um, he lived with some uh, very interesting tantric masters in India. He would sleep in graveyards and drink from skulls. And he's got these books called the Agora books. Really trippy books. And anyway, he was... There was um, the staff at the Ayurvedic Institute where I was studying. There was Robert Swoboda. He was unknown at that time. There was Dr. David Frawley. Anyone know Frawley? He was there. And then Dr. Ladd, of course. So I had like these resources and a lot of one-on-one -on -one and hanging out with these guys when they were unknowns. And then they start pumping books and became uber famous, just like all the Ashtanga rock stars. And uh, all my friends that became, you know, so famous. Um, so it was, uh, th these guys have, have, you know, the, the essential information down. So um, I want to bring it back to this, uh, this aspect of Prakriti Vikriti, because it's really important. So your inherent constitution is set. It doesn't change through your whole life. It doesn't. If you're a Vata Pitta, like I am, I'm Vata Pitta through my whole life. Now, as I just mentioned to you, Vata Pitta Kaf is constantly changing in a 24-hour day. It changes through the seasons. What's summertime, typically? Pitta. What's uh, autumn or fall? Vata, a lot of wind. Winter, kapha, spring, it's actually split. It's kapha in the beginning, and then it starts to move into pitta, and then it goes full pitta. Now, at the junction of every season, those are the times you have to be really conscious and careful. Have you noticed that the junctions of the seasons, a lot of people get a cold or sick? Because there's, a, there's an accumulation of that particular dosha, the doshas are, are, they're actually faults. A dosha is, is a fault. So if your vata pitta kapha is high, then you're going to have particular symptoms. So we want to balance that out within your constitution. So your vikriti is your imbalance. If an Ayurvedic doctor sits with you and they say, your vata is high or your vata is imbalanced or your vata is deranged, <laughs> He's, um, Scott was telling me that, that uh, Dr. Swoboda, Robbie Swoboda, he was, say, he was saying to him that in America, everyone's vata deranged. <laughs> and there's truth to that. The, actually, the whole planet is pretty vata deranged. Why? Because of so much movement. and so, look, at, look what's going on. You can fly, the internet, the, all that stuff. It just stimulates your vata. Having irregular schedules, doing so many things at once. Hang on one second, I'm on my computer. Well, I, well, well, come on in. You know, that's all vata deranging. So that's why it's so important to have a spiritual practice. You start your day in that, hmm. It's like, I like to use the example of like being in the eye of a hurricane. Have you ever been in a hurricane? So in the eye of a hurricane... There's stillness. There's quietness. If you step outside the eye, what happens? <laughs> Spun out. So if you're within your eye, if thy eye be single, thy whole body will be full of light. How about that one? How's that one? Is that a cool one? That was from uh, JC, Jesus Christ. <laughs> he said, if thy eye be single, thy whole body will be full of light. Where is the eye, the single eye? Where is your single eye? 
right here. When thy eye be single, thy whole body will be full of light. When you bring your attention, we will draw your attention to here, light happens. You might be sitting in the darkness because you're so full of all this stuff. But when you go here, and that's what that meditation was that I learned. The, the meditation of light and sound. We're primarily made of that, that light and sound energy. It's a vibration, a sound energy. So the sound energy is a pulling. All the, all the spiritual practices, mantra, asana, pranayama is like a pushing. To getting, getting the soil ready. Then when you're here and you withdraw your consciousness to here, then it's just a sitting and there's a pull. Effort is gone. Effort is gone. You're just there. And you're in just reverent prayer. Oh, this is going to be interesting. <laughs> Talking over the rain. Thank you. <laughs> so can you hear me, David? It's okay? All right. Wow, this is going to be very good. I'll have to protect myself <laughs> so everyone can hear me. Um, so, yeah. So back to Prakriti Vikriti. <laughs> See how vata I am? <laughs> so the, it's really important that you understand I can't do that with each one of you. I can maybe, if I had time, I could go pitta kapha, pitta kapha, vata pit, you know, but I don't have time to do that. It's good that you go to someone who knows what they're doing and you get your prakriti nailed. Then when you know your prakriti, then you have to operate within the context of where you're at. If you're in Bali and it's freaking hot out, guess what? You got to watch your pitta, right? I see people in class, they got rashes and all this stuff going on. Their pitta is getting too high. This is a fiery practice. You have an internal thermostat. You can regulate how hot you get. You can cool it down. You can heat it up through your breath. Now, this practice is a heating practice, is it not? So you don't want to overheat. You have to be able to regulate your breath. When you're in a colder climate, you got to stoke your heat via the breath, via the bandha, via the, how much effort you're bringing. So if you're a pitta person, if you are pitta, and you're in Bali, and it's really hot, and you're doing ashtanga, hello, do you want to burn out? Do you want to turn to ash? It's really serious. You'll get diarrhea. You'll get skin rashes. Your eyes will be all red. You'll be like, ah, a little bit more angry. That's all overheating. That's pitta. Vata's insecurity. Can't sleep. Biting the nails. Cracking, popping, constipation. Vata's high. Kapha is like, they, they gain a lot of weight. They're more lethargic. They, they like watching DVDs of yoga, not really doing yoga, especially, <laughs> especially Ashtanga yoga. They're like, that's too freaking hard. <laughs> but I'll watch David Swenson do it. That's cool. Well, not <laughs> so typically, Kapha people don't come to Ashtanga, right? When you do, it's like, wow, nice. And then you can really push them because they're a little lazier. They like to hang out in poses. You're like, give me a little bit more. Whereas a pitta person, you're like, give me a little less. <laughs> right? So that's the dance that you do when you're a teacher. Yeah. You're just like going through the room and just going, vata person, ground yourself. Pitta person, relax. relax. Here, come on. Come on, I'm almost there. Bind me. Yeah, like, no, no, no. Right. You want a break? You know, like, they're like sweating. There's pools of sweat all around. Oh, come on, man. I want, give me the next pose. I want to do second series, third series. That's good, though. They're like, blah, blah, blah. So that's the art of using your practice. That's the art of working with a teacher that knows Ayurveda. Learn Ayurveda mm. for yourself. If you're a teacher, learn it. It's wonderful. And then you start being more compassionate. Mm. It's like, ah, her pit is just high. She's not a bitch or whatever. No. <laughs> so, so I'm pit this high. Or God, Jesus, man, that guy's so spaced out. It's okay. This is bot is high. Have some compassion. Right? So it's um it's very, very useful. 
Very useful. And again, there's patterns. If you're, if you're mother and father of Vata and Pitta, you're not going to be a Kapha person, <laughs> typically, that, that's carried through in your genetics. So again, your Prakriti stays the same. Vikruti is constantly changing. Depending on where you're living at the time, if you're living in Bali for even a few weeks, it changes the, the, the Vata Pitta Kapha in you. So you have to modify. You have to watch your diet. You have to watch your practice. All these things. You following me? If you're living in Belgium, if you're living in Germany, if you go back there, it's freezing freaking cold. Right? So you have to have more heating things. You have to have more substance. You can't be a raw food person in <laughs> the middle of you know, winter. Now here you could pull it off because raw food, you know, all these things are cooling mm -hmm. typically. Okay? So again, I don't have the time to, to go into this, but I, I, I really encourage you to explore this stuff. Okay? So Prakruti is the same. Learn what that is. I can't do it for you right now, but find someone that can give you an accurate reading of what your Prakruti is. Then, he might say, or she might say, your Vikruti is Vata. Your Vata is very high. You need to balance your Vata. You need to get more grounded. You need to eat more grounding food. You need to slow down. You, need, you may even want to stay in one place for a while. People are traveling and they're doing, I'm traveling, I'm the wandering you know, yogi or whatever. And their vata is like that. <laughs> they, you can, they can't even have a, a decent conversation with you. Their, their eyes are darting, their, their mind is going everywhere. Now Danny doesn't have that because he, he's got like, he, he's got pitta kapha. You see, she's got, she's got kapha pitta. Okay, she's, she's got red hair, but she's got a lot of kapha. She's got like that groundedness. She's excellent for me. <laughs> right? I used to get together with Vata girls and, you know, it's like, woohoo, what? You know, <laughs> and then after a while, it's like, bah! <laughs> right? So, you know, Radha helps to ground me. And, you know, Kapha people, they can save money. I was like, got money? Spend money. <laughs> there was no, I had no bank account. Right? That's what Vata people do. See, it's interesting. What is money? Money's just energy. It's a reflection of your own energy. Right? Vata people are typically bankrupt. <laughs> right? They're borrowing money. Hey, you got some energy that I can borrow? Right? They're like, do you got any? So, you got to learn how to manage your energy. Through your practice, through meditation, through diet. What's really, really interesting is meditation is the key. Mm -hmm. Meditation in your practice. Sitting meditation. It balances it all out. It'll help balance it all out. It will give you more of what's called ojas, tejas, and prana. Mm -hmm. These things are essential. You build those from a spiritual practice. When you have a spiritual practice that resonates for you, that you're, you're honoring your prakriti and you're meditating, you build that. You get juicier. You get fuller. That's ojas. When you get juicier, you're building ojas. You start to get an ojas too. You get a little ass. Seriously. <laughs> Like, people who don't have an ass, they don't have ojas. No, I'm serious. Their cheeks are sunken. They don't have butt. So, ojas, ojas, they're fuller. I look at pictures of myself when I was first practicing, and I was, like, so manic, and I was, like, so thin and so, like, and I was just like, oh, I got to make money. How do I do it? But, you know, two kids, blah, blah. and I was just like, oh, it was crazy. Madness, madness. How could I stay together? How is it possible? People are running around with their head cut off, right? Manic, vata. They don't have any tools. Even though I was getting them, I didn't quite understand how to integrate them. So please, learn them from someone who knows what they're talking about. You were just integrate them. 
No, you were just doing things that were making you more vata too. Completely. Because you didn't know. Completely. I mean, I knew. Dr. Ladd said, yeah, you're vata. Handle your vata and do love. I was like, thanks, Dr. Ladd. Mahabli, you know. <laughs> and so, because I didn't say this. Like attracts like. Right? You meet another vata person. You're like, wow, cool. You're really cool, man. You're kind of like me. I like you. <laughs> right? Wow, I love talking. You like talking? Sure, yeah, let's go travel. You know, it's like, wow, well, well, you know, it's like after a while, if someone's not sane, see, now what happened for me is that it might not appear that way, but I, I started to balance it out and I got more juicy. Mm -hmm. I started to get more ojas. I started to get more tejas. I started to get more prana, but in a balanced fashion. You want all three of those full. So you want to increase all of those. You increase your prana, you increase your tejas, you increase your ojas. Now, prana is refined vata. Prana is refined vata. Now, people that do lots of pranayama and they're meditating five hours and they're blah, blah, they can they can increase their prana, but if they don't have any ojas, Sorry, you'll dry out. You'll start to wither away. Too much prana without ojas, it won't support it. Okay? Ojas is essential. Ojas is at the end of the nourishing of the seven tissues of the body. Within your body, there's seven tissues. There's rakta, rakta, mamsa, medas, ashti, maja, shukra, or artava. Rasa is the plasma, your blood plasma, lymph system, operates with musculature. You have to move. That's why Ashtanga Yoga is like the best movement, physical practice. You're moving the limp around. If you're eating good food, it moves that nutrition around. If you, you could just sit and eat. If you're not moving, it's stagnant. It's like a dead pool. Muscles move lymph. Okay? Rakta is the blood circulation, blood system. Now each one, when they're nourished, when your rasa is nourished, it feeds into rakta. When your rakta is nourished, when your blood's nourished, it feeds muscle tissue. When your muscle tissue is nourished, it feeds fat tissue, which is madas. When the fat tissue is nourished, it feeds bone tissue, ashti. When your bone tissue is nourished, it feeds the nervous system. When your nervous system is fed, there's an Agni at every one also, just by the way. There's the central Agni, digestion, but at every junction there's an Agni. There's a Rasa Agni, there's a Rasa Agni, there's a Mamsa Agni. Every one, it's like a factory. One gets nourished, passes it on. One gets nourished, passes it on. So there's a cycle that goes through. A 30-day window, actually a 28-day window. There's a cycle. After nervous system, Maja tissue, it nourishes reproductive tissue. Shukra, Shukra in the man, and Artava in the woman. And from that nourishment of your reproductive tissue turns to Ojas. At the end of that cycle, Ojas is nourished and it feeds that whole loop. So when your Ojas is nourished, it feeds the Rasa. And there's that closed loop system of nourishing you. And you get fuller and juicier. Now in a male body, if you're constantly ejaculating and losing your seed, that takes away from nourishing your ojas. So you have to learn how to control the energy and pull it in and up and use that energy and not ejaculating. You can have an orgasm, but you don't have to ejaculate. And that can happen through mullabund and moving the energy. It's an art. You know, the whole tantric thing, the sexual tantric thing, that's one tiny little element. It's just like asana is a small sliver of yoga. It's only one limb. Your sexuality within tantra is a small little part of tantra. It's not what tantra is all about. But the sexual component of tantra is there. It's powerful. Your sexual energy is potent. But you have to know how to use it. That's why Guruji used to say, don't let your energy leak. Don't let it leak out. And the lower apertures, it's really easy to let it leak. 
And that's the closest exit for a man. Sorry for being graphic, but we're all adults here. Hopefully, don't let your children watch this. Um, <laughs> but in a lingam, right, the energy builds, and the quickest exit is through the exit there. So in drawing the energy in and up, you have to have really good drawing energy power to pull the energy from there out of the genitals and pull it up and then use it in whatever way you need to. That's the art of it. Not everyone knows how to do that. And then when two people are juicy, then they feed each other. It's not a sucking thing. It's not like, oh, give me some of your energy. Well, give me some. It's like a mutual juiciness. And when we get together, it just goes like that, as opposed to like this primarily, right? There's that energy that we get together sometimes and we're like working our stuff out. It's better you kind of get your stuff together. I mean, you can do it, but you have to be conscious, conscious relating. So when you're really, you know how to do all this magic of asana, pranayama, meditation, eating, all this stuff. You start getting juicy. You start radiating. You're a good ojas, you have an aura. That's what Christ had, the halo, the aura around the pictures that people draw of these avatars. That's their aura. They had good ojas. Saints and sages don't go around sleeping with all their disciples. Not like some of these kooks nowadays, right? They say, oh, yeah, I can fix your sexuality. Come on up. <laughs> no, seriously. How many times have you heard that story? It's like completely absurd. And then the weak people, they can see, oh, she's really weak or he's really weak or whatever. I can take advantage. Mm. You get powerful. You get potent. And then people that don't have that potency, you can take advantage of them. That's why you don't want to do that. You use it for spiritual juiciness to go in and up. Don't let it leak. That's what Guruji was talking about. That's what Mullah Band is all about. To go in and up. You activate your kundalini, the kunda. The kun, you know the kunda when they do Agni Hotra? Kunda. Kundalini. The serpent energy resting at the base of your spine. What are you doing with Mulabanda? You're waking it up. It's like, hello, kundalini, wake up. Now, how do you deal with a, a cobra? It's like, oh shit, what do I do? How do I. Right? People that wake it up, they don't know how to deal with a cobra. They're like, oh, oh God. They might become more sexual. They don't know how to deal with the energy. That's why meditation is really vital and important to move the energy in and up and you go up. That's why they, they depicted Kundalini like a snake. That's the way it moves. It's not, nothing's linear. Things move in spirals. DNA, the earth, we're spinning through space. The universe is spinning. Huh? So, we have to learn how to do, you know, do that magic and stay in the eye of the hurricane. Okay? Wow. Um, Radha, yeah. you have anything to share? Oh, I think all of this stuff that we're spe he's speaking about with Ayurveda, it's really important with the practice. Because what I've noticed over the years with students, especially in the last five years, is People just want to follow what they think is the yogic way. So, yeah. okay, so students come to us and say, they say, oh, but you know, I feel like I'm sp I have to sit in meditation for two hours a day, and, but they haven't even done primary series for six months, or they feel like they have to eat raw food because it's, it's what's healthy. Yeah. And they feel, well, you know, I'm supposed to fast for three weeks because I want to clean my body out. So all of these things are really good intentions, but as Prem is explaining, if you, don't, if you don't know that it's right for you, then you're actually just creating more damage and you think that you're doing something good. And so there's a lot of confusion around that. There's a tremendous amount of confusion around it. It's the example that I always like to use is um, here in Bali, they're amazing with sculpting wood and carving statues and doors and all kinds of stuff. And they have a, quite a sharp object, right? You can make such a beautiful thing with a sharp object or a knife. Or, or you can take that knife and kill somebody. Mm. Is it the fault of the tool? 
No, it's in whose hands it is. So Ashtanga is a powerful tool. You have to know how to use it. It can mess you up if you don't know how to use the tool. So, and if you don't know Ayurveda, you can be creating imbalance. You can be drying out. You can be overheating. You can be, you know, and people say, oh, well, you know, in Ayurveda, they say, Pitta people can't do Ashtanga, oh, it's too heating. Well, if you know how to use it, if you know how to play with fire, right? Fire's not bad. Is fire bad? No, but if you know how to use it, it's a very valuable tool, right? Otherwise, you can't cook your food. You can't take the, you know, getting too much sun, it's not good for you. Get a little bit of sun because we're solar beings. We need to solarize. You need to get solarized. That's why a little bit of sun is good. Don't believe the bullshit about like don't get in the sun. You need a little bit of sun. You need a little bit of sun. And it will solarize you. We're solar beings. We need to take light into our eyes. And there's an art form of watching the sun setting and staring. And it helps to, the light coming into your eyes helps that. There's an art. There's a meditation. Watching sunset, watching sunrise. Don't stare at the, the sun in the middle of the day. Right? <laughs> right? Is that not... I think I mentioned earlier or a couple of days ago, there's, there's seven senses, right? You have your five senses. Number six, your sixth sense is common sense. You don't stare at this, you know, hot burning sun. You don't do 50 colonics and fast for 20 <laughs> days. And then, you know, then all this, all the crazy it. stuff that's going, oh, I heard about this herb. Yeah, you should take it. It's like, well, okay, fine. But um, it might not be appropriate for you, especially as long as you've been doing it, you know. Yeah. But I feel so good. Well, you don't look that great. <laughs> we have so many people. I saw this one guy like a while ago in town in, in Ubud. And I was like, dude, are you eating at all? He looked like a freaking stick. I said, you know what? You need to eat. Hello. He goes, oh, I've been fasting for 21 days. I feel fantastic. I said, well, you're going to die soon. How's that feel? You know? Seriously, when you, when you get like, you get really high. When you do all this vata crazy stuff, you get high. You get high, but then it's like, check out, next body, come back in, you got to do it again. So why not do it right the first time? <laughs> all right. I just want to kind of uh, talk a little bit about um, the practice since we're, we're kind of, we're all here practicing Ashtanga. So, and I'm going to give a little plug. So this book that, um, that kind of came through me. It, seriously, it was like I, I I couldn't keep up with my hand at different points, and I I, I wasn't very good at typing. And um, I even asked someone, "Is there some kind of program where you can like talk into a mic and it will type for you?" And at that particular time, it wasn't real dialed in, so I was like manically like. <laughs> writing notes everywhere on a napkin or whatever. And then I had to decipher through all the notes and put that together and weave that together. And, and um, so slowly, slowly, this, this book came together from a place of my life experience, like David sharing, like just snippets, not like the full thing, obviously, but I share my life experience and all the ups and downs and marriage and this and that's and drugs and various things and beautiful things. And then I, I go into, I launch into Ayurveda. So there is some Ayurvedic principles in here. And then I talk about Ashtanga Yoga and how to use the principles of Ayurveda appropriately in the context of, of Ayurveda and who you are as a unique individual. And then I talk a little bit about Tantra and about meditation and the pineal gland and the DMT and the activation of the DMT through meditation. Because that's all the drug's doing. You can access it through meditation. Okay? So, in writing this, I came up with some, what I, what I felt were key ingredients. Things that I got from Guruji. Things that I had heard Guruji say over and over again. And like, just going, what the heck is he talking about? You know? Like, you, you take it to your anus control. It's like, I'm not quite sure what you mean, Guruji, but I know it's right around there. And I, right? So... His English and his communication, it was like, okay, so I had to decipher, like, what is Mulabanda? Where is it? Okay, there. It's at midpoint. Mm -hmm. There's an energy there. Using it. Experimenting. Oh, huh. Mm -hmm. I can feel it. 
I can see it in people when we discuss it and we talk about it in, in classes and in intensives. We'll talk about it. What's the es essence of Mulabandha? Why is it important? Not just squeezing and tightening and, you know, Mulabandha face. It's like it has to be an energetic quality, not a tightening, holding. You can't hold it like that. It's not possible to keep Mulabandha like that. Otherwise, you'll be like a real tight ass. <laughs> right? Hi, how are you doing, Danny? I got Mulabandha right now. It's relaxed. It's just energetic, like a martial art. Martial artist, not, some, not a martial fartist, which I tend to be sometimes when my vata gets hot. He's good at farting. Uh, you know, the, when the vata gets out of control, there's gas, there's air, right? Vata people, you know how you get bloated and there's... Just kidding, but it's true. Watch a mar martial artist. Anyone ever do martial arts? Watch a master martial artist. How do they move? They have like this 360 degree kind of like whew. watch Bruce Lee do stuff. Watch these guys and they're just like spiraling around their axis and they're just like magic to watch. Now, if you learn Ashtanga correctly, you'll have that same feeling. Mm -hmm. Watch someone who really has Ashtanga down, like David, like Danny, like different people that just are floating, like mm -hmm. Darby. Just watch them float. Beautiful, beautiful, just beautiful, and just staying on their mat and going through all that. Remember, this was all done in a cave, right? This was cave work, right? These yogis, they were like, damn, how do I stay healthy? I got this much space, what am I going to do? You know? Hey, Rajiv, what's going on? They're in the cave next door. Oh, how you doing? Yeah, I tried this thing. It's like, it really works. It helps to keep like the... You know, they're doing research. They're like watching animals and they're like, wow, how did that? You know, like the, the thing that I told you, Yoga Basti, you know how that was discovered? These, this yogi was watching a bird at the riverside and it was sick and just by the river. And he was taking water into his beak and giving himself an enema. And after a couple of days, he flew off. And the yogi was like, hmm, I wonder if that will work. <laughs> So they start like suck doing water in the river and <laughs> sucking water up and then getting any foul matter out and that's that's the inception of yoga basti. That's how they got it. So just observation, watching nature, watching how animals do they animals in nature do they typically get sick? Domestic animals do because they're eating human diets. They're eating goofy stuff. You watch you watch animals in the wild. They don't get sick unless they're really weak at birth, but they're like strong. Watch them run. Watch them climb a tree. Watch them. We're like so awkward, right? We're like, uh, uh. so as the gracefulness starts cultivating, you know, we start to nurture that and, and, and cultivate it through the breathing, through understanding Bandha, all the energetic components that I can't go into that are there. There's safety measures to keep the back healthy, to keep the energy going in and up, to activate Muladhara Chakra, to stimulate and move the energy up the chakras. That's all Mulabandha stuff. And as you go deeper and deeper into your practice, more and more subtle things get revealed to you. In the beginning, it's all raw and kind of like, where do I put my foot? How do I do that? Where am I supposed to look? Blah, 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 blah. All the foundational stuff that looks kind of awkward, right? But you got to crawl before you walk, before you run. So there are the ABCs. And that's all we're doing. And you have to, map, you have to meet people where they're at. Serena Mascara. Yes, very good. That's all you get. That's all? Serena Mascara? Come on, give me more. I want more. Okay. You know, after a while, Serena Mascara B and some standing. Slowly, slowly. What's going on in classes now? I won't mention any names. It's okay. It can be edited, right? Sorry, Zach. You should say sorry to Zach. He's got to edit it. Don't worry. 
sorry, she did. It's all right. Oh. <laughs> you just said her name. Like, you know, everyone knows on the camera who it is. <laughs> so, yeah, you start cultivating all that. Yeah, you start understanding how to use that. Then it's your own personal dance. And then a good teacher will meet you where you're at. Not forcing, not imposing, not do it like this, break it like that. They can see, wow, you know, you're, you're kind of ungrounded. I can see that. Try this. Does that make you feel a little bit more grounded? How's that? Your breath. This is a breathing practice. It's a moving meditation, right? How do you cultivate that? How can you use this practice to have a better life? Right? Not the other way around. Don't impose the practice on yourself. Use the practice as the tool it is that will enhance your life. You'll be a better father. You'll be a better mother, friend, contributor to the, your community, to the world. But you have to know how to use it. Right? Am I right or am I right or am I right? You get three choices. Okay. I want to speak just a little bit about the, the practice and some of the things that, um, that I discovered and Radha and I have been playing with around the, the practice and some of these things that you've heard before, but I just want to kind of gloss over them. Typically what we do in, in, in an intensive situation, what we do like a one-week session or a three-week session, and we have different programs that we're cultivating for uh, people to immerse and go deeper with the, the practice of Ayurveda and Ashtanga Yoga and Tantra. And, um, we, do, we don't do teacher trainings, but we have a, uh, an apprenticeship program where we see um, students who come and practice with us that maybe are already teachers, but we haven't um, given our you know, approval or something like that. I don't know what to call it, but that they need some more work in the room with us. Just seeing how we operate, watching them and saying, what would you do there? And going, hmm, okay, that's an interesting adjustment <laughs> or whatever. Or whatever they're doing and just, just seeing what they know, what they don't know. It's a great way to learn. And um, like anything, it's the practice and observing and doing that. And we have, you know, so many bodies coming, lots of different Vata Pitta people coming. Some Kapha people, mostly Vata and Pitta people, okay? So... Some of the, um, I, it's, it's very interesting, when I was, uh, when I was contemplating and, and wanting to know and really asking for that kind of information to come through, I, I kind of prayed in a deep way like, I don't have a clue as to how to put this down and communicate it. And the, I got kind of distraught because I was going to do like a, a training thing with this woman in, in Oahu. And she was like, okay, well, do you have like the manual together so that I can give it to the students that are coming? There's like 35 people in Oahu that want to do this. I'm in Kauai. And I said, well, uh, not yet. I'll, I'll get it together in a little bit. So I was like, ugh. <laughs> and I, I'd write on a piece of paper and then I'd go, mm, that's not it. <laughs> I had pieces of paper all over me, you know, like crumbled up. And then I just went into, as you can see, I cry easily. Um, I went into like a like oh you know and I start crying and just like oh, shoot I don't know what to do and I I didn't know I was like at the end of my rope kind of thing and I felt the pressure and then when I relaxed and the wave went I just let go and then it was kind of in a dream like a lucid dream state that stuff started coming through and I couldn't keep up with my hand and the image that came to me was a pyramid <laughs> where I don't know why I, I don't have a clue. But I saw a tetrahedron, actually, a three-sided py pyramid. And then it kind of morphed into like a four-sided pyramid. And then what, what came to me was some principles within the practice. That the foundation of a pyramid, the energy of a pyramid is so powerful. Now, I've never been to the pyramids, but I've sat under a pyramid. I've sat in different pyramids and meditated. And it's amazing. And I, I even put in my book, I said, check this out. When you're in Paris, go to the Eiffel Tower. It's not a pyramid, but right in the center, they have a plate that marks the middle of those four huge, gigantic legs. And they have a plate that marks the center. I said, go sit there and meditate on that plate. 
really powerful because it's a vortex of energy that's kind of conducting through that thing right to that center point. And that's how they constructed it, through the geometry that they had to do to make the thing. So I was doing headstand. I was doing like all this. These people are like, what the heck is this guy doing? And it was really fun. Um, and, and again, like I said, I've meditated in other pyramids. And I wanted to create a pyramid structure to meditate in. It's not necessary, you know. But I could see that we create our own pyramid. When we do Padmasana, we're creating kind of a, a, almost a tetrahedra. A tetrahedron is a three-sided pyramid. Bop, bop, bop. Okay? So there's kind of this vortex energy that you create. What's the sacrum? Sacrum's like a triangle, right? At the base of the spine. What's, you know, there's, there's a base, there's a kind of, the pelvic floor is kind of laid out like that also. So there's this, this energy, this geometry, sacred geometry within the body that's there available. There's sacred ways in which you hold your fingers to conduct energy. Holding, I told some of you to close your thumb, put your fingers over that. There's different ways to hold, to conduct energy. When you're holding here, close your fingers, the energy will come back in. If you're opening your hands, energy will shoot out. Just simple stuff like that. Just inter inter interesting energetic qualities. Locking it in, doing different things. All these systems, the mudras, the all the stuff that's there within the technology, which is Tantra. Tantra means technology. That's where the word comes from. Okay? So technique, technology, the information that's there. Hatha yoga is a technology. Hatha yoga. Ha means sun, ta means moon. Hatha yoga. The energy of merging of bringing the, the sun and the moon energy together. That's Hatha Yoga. The right side of our body is predominantly male, solar, fire, right nostril, fire. Left side of the body is primarily female, lunar, receptive, cooling, left nostril, cooling. Inhaling, right nostril, heating, exhale. There's technology. How can you heat yourself up? How can you cool yourself off? When you start noticing like the rhythm of the breathing and the, 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 the rhythm of the breath is constantly changing through the day. Have you noticed that? That one nostril will be predominant more so than another nostril through the day. And notice there's a science of watching that. When your right nostril is predominant, you'll be hungry. You'll be more external. You'll be more like that. When, when the left nostril is more predominant, you'll be more contemplative. You'll be more kind of receptive. You want to open up the left nostril when you go to sleep. You'll be more receptive, calm, relaxed. If the right nostril is open, you'll be more energetic and more... Okay? There's technology. When you start doing your practice, what happens with the nostrils? Have you noticed? I have. Both nostrils operate fully, completely. Integrated, same stream. I can check it. It's both at the end of my practice or right in, you know, after I'm in it. Both nostrils operating. Both hemispheres of the brains operating. There's not one predominant. When you do alternate nostril, it's working on different, it's going back and forth, balancing the right, left, right, left, integration, right, left. Remember I told you I heard on my right side of the body? Remember me saying that? When I was a kid, everything was right side. Oh, charging. Oh, and everything right side hurting. Broke my hand, broke my foot, cracked my knee, cracked my nose. Everything was right side. I lost my father when I was really young. So I was like, Daddy, who are you? You know, charging it. Where's the man in my life? There wasn't any. So I had to like deal with that. So I was just like, oh, and crashing and burning. And then finding Guruji. He was like a father figure. It was like, Daddy, Guruji, thank you so much. I was so thankful to him. So thankful to him. What a beautiful man. He gave so much. And he, he had a personal connection with everyone. 
After a while, there was too many people. He did his best. But there was like, he remembered you. David, why not coming? Raghava, why taking different name? <laughs> you take it one marriage. It's like, sorry, Guruji, I'm American. You know, it's like, this is my third one. I'm sorry, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> oh, boy. The poor guy. He was like, don't smoke ganja. You know, don't take it, marijuana, you know, whatever. He was like, we we're, we're all trying to find our way. And it was cool, it was groovy. It's like, you know, experimenting, la, la. But he was like, just do yoga, meditation, you know. But we were like the Western people going, trying to find ourselves, using psychedelic. It's all good. But Guruji was like, people would ask him, uh, Guruji, you know, Soma, like I remember in Maui with David. Remember those questions, David? They, they, people would ask him, like, oh, Guruji, you know, Soma is like this mushroom. And he's like, you don't take it. You don't take any, you know, it's like, <laughs> and we're like, but Guruji, it's in the text. And like, Shiva's doing it. And it's like, no, you don't take it. <laughs> we're like, ah, fuck that. <laughs> 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 we'd all be smoking. We'd be stone going to class or whatever. And it's like, Guruji's like, oh, yeah. <laughs> We were people swapping, you know, one person would show up with someone else's woman, and then uh, he's like, ah, yeah. oh, bad man. <laughs> ah, bad man. <laughs> right? <laughs> the guy, he was so sweet. So, and, you know, he loved all of us, really, seriously. He just loved people, didn't he? Yes. He loved being in the room. He loved being with people. That was his life, man. He loved people. That's what gave him juice. He loved being in the room with people. He, he loved having a good time. He loved laughing. He would laugh with you, not at you. He would just remember, I'm sure. He would just go, <laughs> like, yeah, you take it again. It's like, I just did it. You take it again. You know, he probably remembers, you know, Krishnamacharya, like, you do it. You know? It's like, Guruji, I just did it. You take it again. You do it again. It's like, ah, man. You hold it. Holding. It's like, you know, like Utplitihi, he was always playing with us, right? You know Utplitihi. You're in Padmas and you're holding, he's like, one, <laughs> two. He'd get the seven and then he'd go back down to two. <laughs> he'd go, seven, two. <laughs> We'd be like, we're like shaking and trembling and he'd get up to nine and then he'd go back down to three and we'd be like, those are We're like trying to, hold, you know, why? You go back up. It's like, or headstand, you know, Joanne, you know, like Joanne did this thing, like, thanks, Joanne. <laughs> like started doing like half an hour headstands. And then he was like, yeah, you take it half an hour headstand. It was like, oh, no, Joanne, damn it. <laughs> Jesus, man. Half an hour. What kind of research is this? Uh, shit. And you're like trembling. It's like, you got to go to like an altered state. Like, <laughs> <laughs> well, rock about you go back up. Ah, shit, he busted me. I gotta go back up. You know, he was having a good old time, man. He had so much fun. So, um, this pyramid thing, what, what came to me was like this principle of inside out, moving from the inside out. And these principles that Gurdji gave us via wherever, I don't even know anymore. Does it even freaking matter? the Yoga Karunta or whatever, I, I give accolades to Guruji. And I, I respect and I, I trust that that's what was going on. When he said, ah, Guruji just made up the sequences, I was like, what? Really? I was like, well, that's cool. I thought so because this pose was here and it moved over there. And it was like, and he was always like, we're like, Guruji, like, what? Th this was over here. You go, no, same method. You take it. It's like, I could have sworn I was grabbing the sides of my feet. Now you want me to grab the toes? Or This pose went over here. The seven handstands are now like second series. They used to be in the, right? He was moving around. Was it written on banana leaves? I don't know. I don't think so. It was a, if it was set in stone like that, why did he alter it and move it around and shift it? And, but we were kind of going along with it. And he was just like, <laughs> they're like following that. And I'm just going to shift it over here. And, Move it there and see, and we go, yeah, boss, okay, I'll do it now, like with the toes. It was all good fun, you know, research, Ashtanga Yoga Research Institute. So inside out, what I got was the bandhas are important. 
What are they about? You got to discover. What is it? Mula Bandha, Udhyana Bandha, Jalandar Bandha. How do you use these technology, the technology of the practice? When do you do Jalandar Bandha? When do you not do it? How do you do it? What's Mula Bandha? What's Udhyana Bandha? We have to know how to use the tools. What's Ujjayi breathing? What is that? How do you make that sound in your throat? Keep the sound. Why is it important? The sound is important. Using your sense of, of hearing, sound. Remember sound? Ethereal? Smooth, even sound. If your breath is broken up, your mind is going to be broken up. If your breath is not smooth, there's a bridge. There's the link between your breath and your mind. That's what the yogis discovered, right? When the breath is not clear, smooth, your mind is restless. That's why pranayama is a miracle. Smooth, deep, holding, breathing. Then the mind calms down. That's the bridge between the mind and the body is your breathing. Technology. Okay, so bandha, breath, drishti. Why is drishti so important? Anyone know? One of the reasons. Okay, I'll tell you. I mean, this is my take on it. All the stuff that I've been talking about is primarily my take, so take it or leave it. Remember I said earlier, a few days ago, take it in demo mode. Check it out. If it works, download it. If not, delete. You have a choice. I'm not cramming it down your throat. So, drishti, out of the five senses, we primarily operate through visual 80% of our energy, we're very visual creatures, 80% of our energy goes out through our eyes. A lot of energy is visual. So drishti is really like laser. Not staring, it's a gaze. You know what gazing means? It's just a soft, like looking at a flower or the face of a baby or something like that. You know, not... You see people doing drishtis and it's like, oh, that doesn't look, they look like the Three Stooges or something. <laughs> you know, like they're like doing too strong and they're like, oh. relax, relax. Just gazing, 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 gazing. And that helps to harness different energies. Nasagrai relates to, what did I say earlier? Nose and smell and what element? Earth. Mulabanda. Nasagrai. Mulabanda. They go together. Interesting stuff, man. Interesting technology that's there. So that's the inside out thing that I kind of came up with. The principles of inside out. Know those. That's important for the foundation of the practice. Then moving from the ground up. Move and build stuff from the ground up, especially your standing. Set the foundation properly. Some of you need to go a little bit more narrow, longer, wider. Find what works. It doesn't, it's not generic. Everybody put your heel to your arch. You may need to go a little bit wider. You may need to turn your foot whatever direction to kind of set the feeling of grounding. When you ground through your feet and your legs, then what happens with the spine? The spine becomes more energetic. We want the energy to go into the spine. You've seen that, that uh, figure from uh, Michelangelo, Michelangelo, the guy that's like this? This energy. Sorry. Okay, Michelangelo painted that, yeah or no? Sorry, okay. Okay, Leonardo da Vinci, my brother. Antonio Carlisi, Leonardo da Vinci. I don't know why I didn't. Well, Michelangelo, he was there too. Um, so, Leonardo da Vinci. Okay? Divine symmetry. Thank you, David. All right? So, yoga. What's the primary axis that we're working from? The spine. The energy of the hands, the legs is feeding to that central part. You get grounded, you're, ground, you're sucking juice, basically, when you know how to do it, from the earth up into you, from your earth through your body. Grounded. 
You can feel it when you get grounded. Then you can move the energy in whatever way you want through your spine. That's when it starts getting juicy and interesting when you have that. Now, if you don't understand the principles and someone's just like turning you, pushing you, then it's just like, uh, 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 I, I don't know how to do that. What the heck? You, uh, okay, I feel it. So, but if you get yourself set and you feel grounded and you're like Parshvokanasana, you bend your knee, you keep the geometry correct, and the energy flows. Trikonasana, energy flows. Spirals, there's spirals happening. Right? Mr. Uh, John Friendly got a little too friendly. <laughs> he got busted. He was one of these Tantra guys. Got a little too friendly with his students. And then they said, oh, John, getting a little too friendly. Anasara Yoga, mm -mm -mm -mm, naughty boy. So that all kind of went away. But he talked about spirals, right? Iyengar talked about that a little bit. And it got a little bit too like, Spiral the, you know, some of the Iyengar people that were coming into Ashtanga was just like, would you shut up? <laughs> you know, spiral the inner coccyx, the outer toe into the, can you feel that? It's like, no, I, just shut up and let me feel and I do the vinyasa, you know. So it got a little bit too much blah, 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 right? So a little bit is good. And that, and, and after a while, it's, you start to feel that, and you can, you can really feel it, and then when you feel it, you got it. Right? Right, Vanessa? Yeah. <laughs> so ground up, important principle. Built from the ground up. Feet, legs, banda, energy. Start with your feet. I, when I look around at people, I always go, I look at their feet. Their feet are all off. One's turning and one's like that. Even like Padangustasana, one's forward and one's turned in. It's like, uh, guess what's going to happen with your spine? <laughs> this is basic geometry, right? You look at it and they're like, they're going down, their spine is twisting, and then they come out of class and they're walking like that, <laughs> right? So if you have imbalances and you don't address them, guess what happens? All you're doing is reinforcing the imbalance, Right? So you come into class and you're like this and you just keep going like that and then you go off to the next event. Then you're walking through the day like that and then you come back and you do it again tomorrow. You're not getting anywhere. You're not addressing. You're not present. You're not seeing the right left side feeling the hatha yoga of your practice. Okay? Another principle. Th these are all four corners of the pyramid, by the way. From gross to subtle. From gross to subtle. Gross to subtle. Feel the physicalness of who you are. Then, slowly, when you start feeling that, how do I place my feet? How do I feel my musculature? How is it set in space? Then, as you master the gross physical stuff, it becomes more and more subtle. The game becomes more and more and more subtle. And it gets to reveal to you on a need-to-know basis. When you're present, when you're aware, then it's like, oh, wow, cool, new revelation. Oh, wow, cool, new revelation. Every time you practice, it's not the same old, same old. You're not like, God, Shtong is so boring, do the same thing over and over again. No, it's not. <laughs> Actually, you're completely different every time you do it. Show up and notice what's going on. Notice the habitual patterns, the samsara, hala, hala. That's what samsara, hala, hala is. You're stuck in the wheel. All the stuff that your parents told you and all the genetics is following you. Samsara, hala, hala. Patanjali, please help me get out of this samsara, hala, hala. That's what that prayer is about. Giving, giving credence to the Guru, to Guruji, to Krishnamacharya, all the way back to Patanjali, all the teachers that are in that lineage. That's what you're doing when you say, one day, Guru Nam. You're giving that. You're bowing. It's like, and they're all behind you, just helping you. And you, when you tap into that, you're tapping into that. You're tapping into that energy. You're part of that whole energetic thing that's been going on for thousands of years. 10,000 years? We don't know. It's beyond recorded history. It's been going on a long freaking time. Okay, and the last one is everything moves in a vortex. 
That's one, that one's a little bit more subtle, but that one's kind of there. All these things that you think like, I gotta rock, and you're, no, just relax, energy. Learn to cultivate, get juicy, learn how to use your energy, use the fulcrums in your body, the geometry, leaning forward, shooting your legs back. All that stuff is like how, learning how to work within the ritam. Ritam is the natural order of things. That's where a ritual comes from. This is a ritual. It's a ritual dance that you do, and you're aligning yourself with the ritam. Okay? That's what the practice is. You're not aligned. When you get aligned, you don't even need this stuff. Why jump around and leg behind the head and all that crap? What's the f- When you start aligning, you do less and you get more, right? That's why as you age, hopefully, your practice gets like more refined. You don't have to do third and fourth and fifth and sixth and seventh or whatever it is, Ninth. right? Ninth series. <laughs> you know what's the most... You know what's the most important chakra, by the way? There's actually eight chakras. Did you know that? Well, actually, but, but there's, the, there's eighth, the eighth chakra is one of the most important chakras. It's the clown chakra. You know the clown chakra? You've never seen a clown? Like with the nose, the red nose, and the wah, wah. So when the eighth chakra opens, then all the other ones open up. When you're happy, when you're having fun, doesn't it? Your energy just becomes freer. Remember what I told you about Richard Freeman. A little hint of a smile on your face as you're practicing. Relax. Why are you so tense and tight when you're practicing? Relax. Have fun. Enjoy it. And in that enjoyment, your energy will flow. See, when you start to surrender more and you let an energy operate through you, as opposed to, oh, I'm going to do it, I'm going to get it, I'm going to get fourth, I'm going to get fifth, I'm going to give me more, I'll hold my breath for four minutes. <laughs> that's willful, that's pushing. Push, 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 push. You want to be receptive. The spiritual energy that you connect with is pulling from inside. When you're receptive, when you are aligned like that, it's just like, here I am. Take me up. Beam me up, Scotty. You know that one from Star Trek? <laughs> Beam me up, Krishna, or wherever, you know. You're just there. And it's a pull. It's a divine pulling. It's magnetic. It's like a, a, a needle. If you have a strong magnet, it just it, when you're out of the way, when the heaviness, which is all your karmic stuff, when that lightens, it's just a pull. It's relaxed. It's an effortless effort. That's the surrendering. But we're so willful. I'm going to do it. I've got to get it. Right? There's a lot of energy that's wasted by so much willful energy. Now, mantra, asana, with that kind of feeling, it's cultivating the soil. We have to do those things. It helps to tone the mechanism, the vibration, the mantra, the sound, the sound current. There's a sound current inside of you. All of these different sounds, like eagle, did you bring the bell? The Tibetan bell or a bell like in the church, they're all symbolic of a bell sound inside, of a conch. <laughs> Exterior sound, there's a sound of the conch inside. There's chirping sound, there's the sound of the wind. When you start going deeper inside, there's light and sound. That's what lighting the candle is. That's what's focusing on all that stuff. So that's why bhajan, kirtan, mantra, all this stuff where you're making sound and vibrating and shifting from a sound place, you're, you're toning the frequency of the inner sound. It's only a reflection, just like our body's a reflection. Okay? So the inner sound, we're just, that's why we're so dialed in that we're so excited about sound and we listen to it. So that's why the Tibetans were dialed into like these certain kinds of sounds and the mantras. Right? I, I stayed in like a Tibetan monastery. 
I used to wake up at like three o'clock in the morning to like, was like, what the heck is that? Sound like some kind of, and I would wake up and just be like, whoa, you know, and it was just like this toning and they would do this mantra and they were doing it all, all the time. Mantra's not just, mantra's good. These mala beads, there's an inner mala bead that you just keep it going. When you learn like a mantra from a guru, a satguru, I have a satguru, someone, an avatar, someone who initiates you into a particular path. Mantra is really powerful. He used to call it Simran. Simran is mantra that you keep going. Your mind is like a meaning making machine and wants to chew on stuff. So you got to give it something. Mantra. Give it. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Hare Rama. Rama. Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ. Whatever it is. I love you. Love, 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 love. Prem, prem. Prem is love. Prem, prem, prem. Just love prem. <laughs> Come on, isn't that a great name? Give me a break. Everyone goes like, hi, prem. How is it doing? I go, yeah, it's great, man. Yeah, give me some. Prem, prem. Reminding me. Prem, 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 prem. I forgot, I forgot. Thank you. Prem, 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 prem. Radha. Krishna Radha. You know, it's like it's the stance. We're, we're here. We're having fun. It's like the amusement park. Come on. Have a good time. But stay holding on to daddy's hand. Right? That's the thing. You hold on. It's like that's that connection. When you're plugging into what I call the internet, not the internet, the internet, that's plugging in. I'm plugged in. Download me, baby. You know, like, well, yeah. And then you can ask, well, I'd really like some, you know, you can talk. When you have like a teacher inside, just ask. You, if your teacher's Ganesh, if it's, you just go, Ganesh, whoa. Got some obstacles going on, man. Like, a little help would be nice to remove them or give me, make me clear or Krishna or, or a living guru. A living guru. This, this is really kind of interesting phenomena. Avatars are always on the planet. There's one on the planet all the time. And there's probably several we don't even know about. They're obscure places in the Himalayas or wherever. But they're here to take us home. This is not our home. We're leaving. We're only here for a momentary amount of time. Have a good time. You're in the amusement park. But stay hold on to daddy's hand. And then you'll have a good time, right? You go through the amusement park and you're like, Woohoo, this is great, dad. Can I go on that? Sure, son. Come on. Let's go on it. Wow, this is really fun. If you lost his hand, you lost mommy's hand, and you're in the amusement park, you're like, holy shit, like this is scary. Oh, where am I? <laughs> That's, I'm not going on that. You know, and there's all these spooky, kooski people at the amusement park. They're like, come here, little boy. <laughs> here, come play this game. It's like, no, 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 where's dad? Where's that? Yeah. That's kind of like what we're doing. Like, so plug in, get connected, like ask for help. Whoa, I have no idea what I'm doing. Hello, please help me. And you'll get help. That's grace. That's grace. You have to put in effort. You got to ask. Otherwise, they, it's just like, yeah, go play. <laughs> have fun. Go do it. Chase money. Chase the sexual thing. Get famous. Do all that stuff. You happy? You happy? Possibly. I'm sure Sting is happy. He seems like a cool dude. He got famous. But I've met some pretty famous people that are not real happy. But they got money, fame. They look good. But they're like, damn, can you help me with all this stuff? Well, I don't know. You got to, you know, just change the inner thing. And you can still be an actor or famous musician or plumber or whatever it is. You know? All right. Let's open it up for uh, some questions. And then we'll close it for today. Any questions? No questions. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> I, I, I used to love that one. Guruji would say, any questions? And then everyone would just be sitting there like, and then he'd go, thank you very much. And we'd go, well, yeah. <laughs> ask him a question. Keep him there for a little bit. Yeah. Talk about the male uh, part of the, with the ejaculation and, and saving the energy. What does it look like for the female? 
Yeah. yeah. You go through the cycle and lose a lot of energy that way. Is there a way to save up energy that way? There's, um, there is. And I'll speak a little bit about it, but Radha can maybe speak a little bit more. I, it's so wonderful that Radha is with me and doing all... Because I, I used to talk about this before, and when I was just solo, the male guy talking about, like, yeah, menstruation. You know what I'm saying? like, I don't know what I'm talking about, but, you know, but... So now I can just go, Radha! <laughs> can you, like, talk about the female parts and the anatomy and where they... Because even Mulabanda is different. Like, it's more interior. Males are more exterior. Have you noticed? <laughs> The, the, we wear clothes and stuff, but, you know, you see them naked, it's more, the plumbing is exterior. <laughs> so women are more interior. They feel more. They're more interior. They feel deeper. So in the Hatha Yoga practice, a male needs to cultivate a little bit more female energy, be more receptive. Right? And there's the whole, you know, new age thing. Oh, well, you know, some of these guys go over the edge, and then they're like a little bit too feminine. Right? So balance between male, female. If I'm a male in a male body, I cultivate some female energy. Otherwise, I'm like agro man and going and hurting myself. And that's why all the sports and everything else are male oriented. And look what's going on on the planet. Who's controlling the planet? It's mostly male oriented. Look at all that crap that's going on, right? And all the, it's just male oriented. I'm gonna take over this, I'm gonna do like that. And now the women are so confused, they start turning into men. Meaning they become more masculine. That was the one serious talk that I ever had with my daughters. I was like, please, Shanti Mirabai, don't lose your femininity in this male-dominated world. And they were like, oh, okay, Dad. You know, it was like, Whew. you know, but it was like, okay, I'll give it my best shot. But I just felt like to talk to them about that. And they did really good, actually. Yeah. So you were saying about how to, how to preserve, energy. preserve your energy? Yeah. Men preserve energy from not ejaculating or drawing it in. And then women, how do we save energy through our menstrual cycles? Well, one way that comes to mind, especially within the practice, and a lot of women have asked the question this week, is you know, when you are on your cycle, you take some kind of break from practice, whether it's three solid days of practice off or... If you are going to do your practice, you make it more meditative and you're not using Mula Bandha and you're not drawing the energy up and you're keeping more of a relaxed feminine energy. So that's a really <laughs> important way of reserving the energy. What I've found, since you're asking, is a lot of women in this practice lose their cycle mm. after a period of time, yeah. which is al also means that their energy is not being used correctly. Yeah. So if you're doing this practice for a long time and all of a sudden you don't get a menstrual cycle anymore, then something is not going right in your body. I mean, I've been practicing for 24 years and I've never lost my menstrual cycle. So it doesn't, and I learned, you know, how far I learned in advanced practice and it, it never affected my That's menstrual that cycle. That's that juiciness, you see? Like when there's a juiciness of fullness and the cycle of the tissues are being nourished, if they're not, it cuts it off. Mm. It's a natural thing of the body kind of cutting off and then they lose their cycle. It's not healthy. And it happens all the time. And you see time, it with Vata so. people. You, typically it's a Vata girl. So whereas for men though, they want to draw and not ejaculate. For women, you really do want to fully, like you don't, it's not. With your menstrual? Well, yeah, you don't want to hold it back, of course. But there's yeah. also, if it's, there's different degrees of menstruation, right? Some women have like, three or four heavy days, too much blood, and they're like exhausted. That's not good. Mm. That's not healthy. They become anemic. They, they lose a lot of blood. That's like losing semen. Mm -hmm. You see? So in the menstrual cycle aspect, women need to cultivate that through their diet and through other things, mm -hmm. and sexually too. A woman can have orgasms, and they ejaculate also. But there's, um, the, the male is the one that just doesn't know how to activate that. And, and the ejaculation, that's where they lose their ojas. Mm. So the men, they get, um, they just lose like their vitality because they don't know how to manage it. And then as you go older, actually this is a very interesting um, uh, fact within Ayurveda. You're born with a certain amount of ojas. It's like, it's like in your inheritance. Here, my son, my daughter, here's 
your ojos. Mm -hmm. Now, sometimes people don't have a very big inheritance. People that have like a good constitution, like Danny's father, who lived to be 104, <laughs> he had good ojos. Okay? He had a good attitude. He was probably funny as hell. You know, he had a good attitude. Stress-free, but he had good ojos. If you don't have, and, and the ojos thing, I think David said 20 or Danny, did you say 20? 19. Your ojas, who said 20, said the age 20? 19. 19. You, you said 19? Mm -hmm. The way I understand it is when you hit about 30, actually. If you watch people, when they hit about 30, if they haven't been doing anything with their life, they can party and they're like in their 20s and like, woohoo, they're staying up late and partying a lot. And then they hit 30 and they keep doing that and they're like, oh, and you see like this skid. So if they're not doing yoga and rebuilding the ojas, <coughs> it's a downhill skid. And they start aging rapidly. So you get like this bank account of ojas. And if it, it gets used up by the time you hit 30, if you're not building it, you don't know how to build your ojas. Okay? And ojas is spent by too much stress, over practicing, pranayama. I want to be enlightened. I'm doing five hours of pranayama and meditation. Blah, blah, blah. Too much. It'll, it'll suck up your juice. And you see people that want to be so, they want it so bad. And it's, mm. it's a beautiful thing on one level, but they're overdoing it. Find a balance with your practice. And over time, it will naturally happen that you can be in it more. And it's natural. It's not forced. Just like when I was talking about getting up at 3 in the morning. I'm not forcing that. I want to get up. I like getting up at that time. I'm not like forcing myself to get up. Mm -hmm. And if you don't manage your diet and other things, you, you can't pull it off. You can't pull it off. So, you know, women, it's a different game. Slightly different game, but it's the same kind of thing going on. Yeah, I think it's just, you have to look at all aspects of your lifestyle, you know, to preserve your energy. But typically we've seen a lot, we've, we've had a lot of women coming to class and I'm sure some of you teachers have had women come and they go, I don't have my period. I lost my cycle a couple years ago. And you look at them and they're all dried out. They're dried out inside and out. Their vata is like... Whoosh. You don't want that to happen. It's not like a goal to like lose your period. So. Any other question? Sorry, yeah. Well, diet's not the only remedy. There's other aspects of your life and your living that you have to look at to help to do that. Now, you might be eating like the, an, a diet that's not good for you. It's like, oh, I changed my diet. I'm a vegetarian. You could be, you know, there's all these fads that are going on, and they're not necessarily appropriate for certain individuals. A vata person should not be a raw foodist. They just can't handle it. Now, after a while, if you know how to manage your prana and your vata, you could pull it off and you could eat more raw. But there's a lot of raw food people that are just like so spaced out, ungrounded, like blah, like, and they're fasting and they're colonics and they're like, it's just really silly what's going on because they're ignorant and they follow like they're sheeples. You know, sheeple, meh, they're following like the herd, <laughs> right? They're like, oh, wow, that's trendy. Yeah, I'll be raw, fo raw food. Yeah, cool. And they get high. You get high from it. But you get so high that you're so ungrounded that the body starts falling apart. Teeth start falling apart. You know, I, I, we've known quite a few people. Their teeth start rotting. And, but it's like, mm -hmm. wow, I feel so good. Well, how come your teeth are rotting? Yeah. <laughs> you know, That's stuff like that. It's like insane. You know, mm, you might want to eat. They're like ready to break, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's like there's a lot of stuff we just kind of ignore because it's fatty. Mm. Right? Any other? Yeah. Um, yeah. Earlier you mentioned that uh, yoga helps us you know, to be better, uh, better sons, better husbands, better wives, better friends. Yeah. Um, uh, do you think uh, a supreme yogi is necessarily always a good man? So, you know, perhaps Guruji, I don't know him, but by all accounts, he, it's, um, you know, he, he, it seems like he was. But then other people with with a long practice, a lot of experience, and you know, do pranayama, and then maybe one friend. Um, it seems like 
do not always live by um, what, what they preach, at least. So um, I'd just like to hear. There's a difference between someone who does yoga for a long time and a yogi. <laughs> You know. He's asking, like, um, someone who's been practicing a long time, does it, you naturally become a good person? Like, John Friend's been doing, you know, yoga for a long time. He's been doing all the practice of pranayama. He's got his own style of yoga, and, and then he does something like that. We're all human. We're all human, and, you know, we have faults. We're not perfect. But you have to know how to use the technology. So his... Now, in his particular case, as an observer, again, what happens, even in the Yoga Sutras, they said you'll get siddhis, you'll get powers, you'll get miraculous powers of, you know, you're feeling good. Mm -hmm. you, you have, he's, he was a char charismatic figure. Mm -hmm. People are like, John Fran, oh, I love you, and uh, heart opening, and all this stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Everyone, they want, who doesn't want their heart open and to be like that, you know? I mean, some people don't. They're like, mm -hmm. but he was all about that. You know, and like, and, and people were like really enjoying that. But then in the, in the inner circle, he was taking advantage of people. Mm -hmm. And then he was playing with the sexual energy thing. And the sexual energy is kind of little, it's, it's, your, it's your most potent energy, right? It's that, that's where you can recreate another human being. It's at the end of the cycle, right? It's the seventh tissue. It's a very rich, full energy. If you don't know how to use your sexual energy, it can plummet you down. So you have to know how to move it in and up, not out and down. Mm -hmm. And then if you're, if you're cultivating, you're doing some of that, you know, playing with the tantric sexual energy stuff, you start cultivating some energy and then you start going, hmm, okay, yeah, well, you're kind of cute and, you know, I'll have two or three of you, little gopis, little groupies. And it's happened over and over and over again. I've seen it over and over, and over again. So you have to be a good plumber. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the plumbing is very important. <laughs> I tell people sometimes, it's like, you know, when people ask me, like, what, what do you do for a living? It's like, I'm a plumber. <laughs> it's like, I, sometimes I don't even want to be a yoga, you know, like, recognized as a yoga teacher. It's like, hmm. it, it's just funny. Yeah, David. <coughs> Yeah. Yeah, until you get to that level, how can you judge anyone? Yeah. Oh, he's not a yogi. Not. Unless you're at that level, you can't see. You know what I mean? It's like you, you can't tell. How can you tell? And Jesus said, judge not, lest you be judged. Yeah. You know, it's just, it's not possible. But there's signs and things that's like, hmm, that doesn't seem quite. Look, when you hone in your, you know, like your vibratory rate, you start going, mm, that, that, you know, I have like a, I've started to culti cultivate like the bullshit meter. Like, nah, 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 <laughs> bullshit, bullshit, bullshit. Like people can't get away with as much with me. I used to be quite naive and I'd be like, bullshit, bullshit, bullshit. And I would go, mm, no, sorry, thank you very much. And, you know, I'm, and veer off and not interact with that particular person. God bless you. I don't want to interact with you. Have fun. Good luck with that. <laughs> you know, like, and, um, and then move on. And then find other people that like hone in, you know, like, wow, Danny, shit, what a brother, man. Love you. Awesome. Manju. You know, like you find your own like that. And that's, that's, the, that's the family. That's the satsanga. You find people that resonate and they build and they nurture you. And it's like, hey, there's not a lot of people, the, the people out in the world that don't have that, they're like, what do I do? How do I do that? Oh, I think I'll do drugs. I think I'll do pharmaceutical drugs. <laughs> I think I'll do Valium. I think I'll drink more. I think I'll do heroin. I think I'll do crack. I do think I'll do, I think I'll make more money. I think I'll have more sex. That'll do it. That'll solve everything. People are like, they're really, and that's why there's such a big wave of people coming to yoga. Right? They're like, give me an answer. When you're so fed up, when you're so fed up, that's typically when you come to yoga. <laughs> Either very intelligent or very desperate. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's, a, there's a quote here by my teacher. He said, 
Anyone who suffers the pain of separation shall be comforted. Mm -hmm. So when you get to that place where you're like, you're so willful and I can do it and I can make more money and I'll be happy. And, and then you get to that place and you're like, whoa, that ain't it. And you're like, just the pain is so deep and you're just like, ah, you'll be comforted. Mm -hmm. Then at that point, that's the surrender point. That's Ishwara Pranidhana. You just go, I surrender. <laughs> I basically, I, I don't know what the hell's going on. That's what happened with me and Sha when Shanti passed. I was like, I, 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 I don't have a clue. I don't know. What, it's not in my hands. Nothing is in my hands. I'm just like, please help me understand this. Please. Mm -hmm. And I've been given so much grace and understanding and love from inside and outside. Anyone else? Question. Yeah. It's yeah. 4.30. It's 4.37. You mentioned it yesterday, and you did it with me in adjustment as well. In some asanas, we close the feet like that because we don't want the energy to be out. Right. But you also mentioned with me that in the practice in Vira Bhattasana 2, we do like that, and energy go that way. Yeah. Look, you can, you can move your energy. It's, it's the where you direct your energy. Okay? So, I'm just saying, as a simple mudra, as a simple exercise, energy goes out through your fingers. Okay? So, if you're doing this all the time, and you're doing that, and the energy's going, it's just simple. Simple stuff. Just redirect it. We're harnessing it in within this. This is the sphere you have. If you take your hands like this, this is how much you're responsible for <laughs> You're not responsible for any other energy. That's it. As far as you can reach, that's what you're 100% responsible for. Outside of that circle, somewhere that's outside of yourself. So there's just different ways of directing it. Outside, directing it. You know, you can project your energy. It's okay. You can let your energy go this way. You can let it go down in the earth. You can, there's all kinds of ways of doing it. This is, it doesn't mean that, oh, if you have your hand out like that all the time, you're going to lose all your energy and you're going to fall apart. It's just, you're harnessing it more. That's what Mullabhana and cultivating it, it's recirculating it. It's recirculating it. And you get juicier. And out of that juiciness, what are you going to do with it? You have a choice. You're going to go make money? You put all your energy into making more money? All your juice? All your juiciness? That's what people are doing. They're like working so hard and all that energy and the food they're consuming and breathing and, uh, and they're working for the man. That's why yogis are unemployable. They figure it out and they go, wow, I'm not working for the man anymore. I'm going to work for myself and God. And that's the whole Bhagavad Gita, man. Bhagavad Gita, you're working for Krishna. You're on Krishna's team. It's like, I'm doing it for Krishna. You know, like that. Anyone else? One more question. Let's close it. Yeah. About, uh, you said earlier that man can have orgasm without ejaculation. Isn't it ejaculation is equal to orgasm? No, it's completely, okay. yeah, That's you're a, not yeah. a man and it's like, no, it, it's <laughs> eja ejaculation, here I'll clarify for you, honey. Ejaculation, you have a husband, right? Yes. Okay, ejaculation is actual fluid that comes out of his body. The sperm and the but you semen. Said you want to hold it. Yeah, so you learn to you yeah. learn to have an orgasm. It's like the same kind of feeling. You can have it in asana practice. Wow. That'll get you up in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> How about that in your thing. Wanna have an orgasm in your practice? Come to my class. <laughs> Through Mulabunda and let, you know. No, seriously, you can. So it's cultivating that energy that's inherent there, but don't let it, it's the, the, if it goes out with the semen and the ejaculative fluid, if you're doing that all the time, you start to lose your ojas. If you can harness that energy, and it's, it's, the, it's almost like the breaking point where um, you're not a man, again, but a man, men, you, you feel like you're right there and then you stop and you, you lay quiet with your partner and you pull your energy. And it shifts it to another level. 
And then you can start to have, you can have an orgasm. It's like a, a wave of energy that kind of goes through your body. And then you go and you take it to another level. And you keep having like an orgasm like a woman. And you keep getting higher. And then at a certain point you just go, wow, that's it's awesome. How you doing? It's good. And then, thank you very much. What, what a beautiful time we had together. As opposed to, <laughs> holy shit, I'm exhausted. You know, I... I <laughs> I'm going to share with you something and don't you steal this <laughs> Guruji standing in Samasthiti practice and all is coming on the back me standing in Samasthiti and doing some kind of goofy thing too much coming all is going <laughs> okay <laughs> thank you